Welcome everyone to the Research Brown Bag. It's nice to see you all. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce our speakers today. Um, we have two speakers who will both be presenting. The first is Victoria Chan. She's a senior community advocate with the Workers' Rights Program as part of the Asian Law Caucus. And we have Alejandro Domenzain, a program coordinator who's part of the Labor Occupational Health Program at Berkeley. So welcome to Victoria and Alejandra. Thank you so much for making time for this and I look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Um, thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. Um, my name is Victoria Chan, and I'm the Senior Community Advocate at the Asian Law Caucus. Um, Alejandra and I will provide a short presentation um, about our report, um, Few Options, Many Risks, Low-Wage Asian and Latinx Workers in the COVID-19 Pandemic. Together, we'll review some of the findings from our survey, um, which analyzes over 600 responses from workers in California, particularly Asian and Latinx workers across several industries, including the restaurant, domestic home health care, and the janitorial slash hospitality industries. We'll discuss the significant gaps um, in compliance with health and safety requirements and enforcement at the workplace. We'll also highlight some of the conditions and difficult choices that workers um, have been struggling with during the pandemic. We'll share some of our recommendations, which is relevant to some of the bills that are being um, sponsored this year. Before we dive into our report and our findings, Alejandra, could you please walk us through an overview of our presentation today? Sure, thank you so much, Victoria. So today we're going to do some introductions of our organizations. We'll tell you a little bit about why we decided to do this report. Um, we'll go over methodology and then our findings. Um, we have some recommendations that are part of the report that we'll highlight and tell you a little bit about the coverage that it's gotten and some reflections that we have you know, going forward for future research or other questions that we were left with. And as Victoria mentioned, there are um, some you know, legislative initiatives in this cycle that we think that this report could support. And we'll have some time at the end for questions as well. Thanks, Alejandra. Um, why don't we dive into the next slide, um, an introduction about the Asian Law Caucus. Um, so for folks who might not be aware, um, the Asian Law Caucus, ALC for short, um, we were founded in 1972 as the nation's first legal and civil rights organization serving the low income Asian Pacific American communities. We have six different program areas, including housing rights, immigrant rights, criminal justice reform, national security and civil rights, and the voting rights and census programs. Um, and my program in particular, workers' rights, um, we provide legal counseling, policy advocacy, direct services, and impact litigation on behalf of low-income immigrant workers on various workplace issues, including wage and hour, retaliation, um, unemployment insurance, and health, workplace health and safety. Um, and because of our history, our team's language capacity, and our location in the heart of San Francisco's Chinatown, many of our clients are um, Asian immigrant workers, most of whom are either monolingual or limited English proficient. Many face um, the issues that are highlighted in this report, such as the lack of health and safety rights at work, retaliation, and no paid sick leave. Um, many of our clients are also restaurant workers, um, caregivers, janitors, nail salon workers, and drivers. We work very closely with worker centers here in the Bay Area, such as one of our survey partners, the Chinese Progressive Association, to support workplace organizing and development of immigrant worker leaders. And I'll tell you a little bit about LOHP, the Labor Occupational Health Program. So our mission is to promote safe, healthy, and just workplaces. And the way we do that is to really build the capacity of both workers and worker organizations so that they can take action, right, to improve their working conditions. And we do that in different ways. Um, some of the main ones are training for action. So our trainings are very interactive and skills-based and problem-solving to really build the leadership of workers themselves and you know, CBOs and unions and worker centers um, to be able to take practical action. So to that end, we do a lot of, um, we create educational programs and campaigns. As you can imagine right now, we've done a lot around COVID for different industries. 
Um, we also do policy advocacy and support and community engaged research. You know, this report is a great example. And some of you may also be aware of our uh, report a couple years ago on sexual harassment and assault in the janitorial industry um, called The Perfect Storm. We can go to the next one. Um, so right when the shelter in place order was issued here in California, um, many workers were instantly laid off, um, but many low wage workers were still working on the front lines, including those who care for our grandparents and parents at residential care facilities. Um, and as the Bay Area in California has gone through the reopening phases, um, more and more workers have been called back to work including those who help us prepare our takeout orders, um, clean our schools and other public spaces. Um, we have been hearing from these community members um, where they disclose their fear of getting sick and or exposure to COVID-19 at work um, and exposing their loved ones to COVID-19. Um, these workers didn't know what their rights are. And we also provided hundreds of consultations and we realized that these issues are systemic it didn't just impact one industry or one ethnic group of workers. So we wanted to collect um, information about the realities um, that these workers um, are facing to help inform ongoing advocacy efforts to address the gaps that we were seeing. Um, we reached out to Alejandra at the LOHP um, to partner with us and recruited organizers like the Fight for 15 um, to help us reach out to workers. Um, and many of the realities um, that we heard through our consultations and results of the survey, which we'll discuss in um, a few minutes, are actually really similar to Evelyn. Um, we see her um, to the left, um, her story. So let's hear from her, um, her own words, how working during the pandemic has been. Um, and if we hit enter twice, um, we'll see a English translation of um, what Evelyn is saying um, to the right. I think, Lauren, you might need to turn on your mic. Ah, sorry about that. Okay, tell me if you can hear it now. I can start it over if you want. Sorry. No worries. I'm not able to hear it yet. Ah, okay. Um, I think there's a setting when I share. Hold on a second, sorry. Um, when you share that you can um, make sure you share the audio also. Um, let's see. Yeah, I'm not sure. Does anyone know who does um, Google Slides, how you share the audio, there's some trick and I'm just not remember remembering. Is it, is it not in Zoom itself? There's, I know there's a toggle in Zoom. Um, when you hit share screen, Lauren, when you hit share screen, mm -hmm. um, then it'll show you all the different screens that you're gonna pick from to share. And okay. down in the, I think in the- Oh, uh, there it is. Oh, yeah, share sound. Okay, thank you. That was, the, that was exactly it, sorry. Okay, sorry, apologize. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Evelyn Alfaro. Soy miembro de Mujeres Unidas y Activas y de la Coalición de Trabajadores del Hogar de California. Soy trabajadora del hogar por más de 11 años. Como trabajadora del hogar, estar trabajando durante la pandemia del COVID-19 realmente me ha hecho sentir desprotegida, desvalorizada, y no tomada en cuenta como un ser humano que soy. Y esto realmente es tan indignante, ya que yo no cuento con un equipo básico de protección de salud y seguridad. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Evelyn Alfaro. Soy miembro de Mujeres Unidas y Activas y de la Coalición de Trabajadores del Hogar de California. Soy trabajadora del hogar por más de 11 años. Como trabajadora del hogar, estar trabajando durante la pandemia del COVID-19 realmente me ha hecho sentir desprotegida, desvalorizada y no tomada en cuenta como un ser humano que soy. Y esto 
realmente es tan indignante, ya que yo no cuento con un equipo básico de protección de salud y seguridad en mi lugar de trabajo. Me gustaría que mis empleadores pudieran realizar el cambio, pudieran proporcionarme a mí como trabajador del hogar y a todas las demás trabajadoras del hogar de California, el equipo básico de protección de salud y seguridad y así evitar que nosotras nos contagiemos en nuestros lugares de trabajo. Esto es vital, esto es urgente y lo merecemos ahora. Gracias. Can we have the next slide, please, Lauren? All right, so just to tell you a little bit about our methodology, um, we had 28 questions. We started with a lot more. There was so much that we wanted to know, but we thought that was kind of a reasonable number to expect people to click through. Um, everything that we did was in the three languages, Chinese, Spanish, and English, not just the survey questions themselves, but all the outreach materials, et cetera. And um, the kind of criteria to participate was you know, very minimum. You had to be 18 years or older. You had to be a worker, so as opposed to you know, a, a manager or a business owner. And you had to have worked at least five days since May. That was just because we wanted people to actually have experience with, you know, pandemic conditions. Um, and we picked May because, you know, by May it was pretty clear what the guidance was about what employers were supposed to be doing to protect people. So there's kind of like no excuse if it wasn't happening. Um, and, you know, the, the categories of questions included everything from, you know, how much people were getting paid, what their concerns were, um, what protections they were getting or not getting, um, access to paid sick leave, and then also what happened if they did speak up about a problem. Um, and just as an incentive, we provided five uh, $100 gift cards in a raffle for people who participated in, um, in, the, in the survey. Next slide, please. Um, and over the two months when the survey was open for submission, we collected a total of 636 um, responses from community members on the front lines throughout California. Um, and because one of our mandatory questions included the respondent's zip code, we were able to identify that most of our respondents are actually from the Bay Area. Um, and we were able to collect so many responses because of the power of worker centers um, and community-based organizations um, with membership. And these organizations include the Chinese Progressive Association, Fight for 15, the Filipino Community Center, Lao Family Community Development Incorporated, the Multicultural Institute, and the Maintenance Cooperation Trust Fund. Um, they helped us disseminate the survey to community members via email, messaging platforms like WeChat and WhatsApp, um, and also text messaging. And they also helped us collect responses in person um, by calling, or in some instances, directly filling out the survey form or an Excel spreadsheet with the worker next to them, and in a safe way, of course. And so in addition, when we received all the survey responses, we also conducted some worker interviews just to get a little bit more context and more in depth. Um, and so we conducted eight of those interviews. Um, the way that we chose them was partly through some respondents of the survey that you know, there was something that they answered that we were curious about to learn more. And then some were also um, referred to us by partners. And so these were all done in um, Spanish, Mandarin, and Cantonese over the phone. Um, workers got an additional stipend for participating in that. And they covered, you know, the topics that you see here on the slide. And we were especially interested in, in those that had had an experience with COVID in the workplace, whether it was them or a coworker and kind of what happened as a result of that. Next slide, please. So what did we find? Um, of the 636 responses, we found that 41% um, identify as Asian and 40% identify as Latinx. Um, over a third of respondents actually worked um, or work in the restaurant industry. Um, almost a fifth of the respondents work in the domestic work and home healthcare industries, including California's in-home supportive services. 
and about 10% are employed in the janitorial and hospitality interest, uh, industry. As we can see in figure one, um, a majority of the workers, 57%, um, report being paid $15 um, per hour or below, with a significant number of workers, about 17%, paid less than the state mandated, mandated minimum wage of $12 per hour. Um, this is consistent um, with the clients that we see here at the Asian Law Caucus and many of the members and workers um, involved with our partner organizations, many of whom we serve are low income and uh, oftentimes have other vulnerabilities um, that put them at greater risk on the job. Um, what was really interesting to me um, was that almost two thirds of our respondents identified as women um, who are oftentimes not just supporting their families um, in their home as a cook or caregiver, um, but also working outside of the family um, to pay rent and bills. Um, we'll actually hear some of the concerns um, that this specific group of workers have um, during the course of the presentation. Next slide, please. So not surprisingly, one of the findings was that the vast majority of workers had concerns related to COVID-19, so 80%. And it's interesting that this applied regardless of income, race, gender, even union representation, um, workers were concerned. In some cases, there was health concerns, like one in five were concerned that they had a, a medical condition that would put them at greater risk. Others were concerned about those that they live with or had contact with and putting them at risk as well. And there was a huge concern over economic well-being. So, you know, almost half worried that how they would support themselves if they got COVID-19. Um, and then even some, like one in five, were concerned that they, if they had to quarantine or miss time from work, that they wouldn't be able to get their job back. So, you know, that has big, really big implications because if you're not sure that you're gonna get your job back if you leave, right, it's, it puts a lot of pressure on you to maybe work while sick or work even though you were exposed. Mm -hmm. um, we also found um, that workers um, who are paid less than minimum wage are actually less likely to have received information from their employer about COVID-19 protections um, when compared to those who are receiving higher wages. Um, according to the law, um, it's the employer's responsibility um, to provide workplace health and safety information and training to their workers. Um, but unfortunately, we found that almost one in five, 19%, of all survey respondents um, report that they did not receive any information um, at all from their employer about COVID-19 um, worker protections. Um, what was really terrifying to me um, is that two, -third, two thirds of those who were paid below the minimum wage received zero information on what to do if they're sick or exposed to COVID-19 compared to um, the 30% of the highest um, tier wage earners. This is also consistent with what we hear from our clients at the ALC, um, those who are paid below the minimum wage or right to minimum wage and didn't get any information from their employer on what to do if they experienced COVID-19 symptoms or exposure. Um, that's zero information on rights like paid sick leave, um, which provides some income to workers who are the breadwinners of their families and they wouldn't need to choose between their health and safety of themselves and their coworkers versus putting food on their family's table. We'll talk a little bit more about um, paid sick leave in the upcoming slides. So another risk that we've heard a lot about in the pandemic is not just risk to the virus itself, but other things that have arisen. So one is, you know, almost 30% of respondents had had a negative interaction with either a client, a customer, a coworker, someone who was not following the COVID-19 guidelines. And so that put them at risk of harassment or in some cases even violence. And we wanna highlight, this was one of the cases where you know, in some industries you see certain patterns and this emerged for the restaurant industries that the restaurant workers were four times more likely to encounter conflict. Um, and you know, almost half actually reported some kind of negative interaction with someone not following the, the guidelines. And in fact, two of them reported you know, actual physical assault. And if you guys are familiar with the work of the Restaurant Opportunity Center, they, this is very consistent with um, actually very recent studies that they've put out regarding uh, the experience of restaurant workers during COVID. And also the Fight for 15 has documented similar trends in the fast food industry in particular. 
next one, please. Um, we also found that 31% of respondents, either themselves or their coworkers, um, have actually raised concerns about COVID-19 workplace safety. 31% um, raised the concern and the employer addressed or fixed the problem. 17% raised the concern and the employer only partly addressed the problem. And 7% raised the concern and the employer did not address the problem. 4% of the respondents um, selected not available, um, and we were actually missing responses from about 10% of the respondents. Um, if we add the second, third, and fourth percentages together, um, that would mean that over half of the respondents um, reported a concern at work. Um, in our survey, um, we broadly included, um, raised a concern about COVID-19 workplace health and safety. Um, we didn't specifically define what the concerns were, but they can include anything from, as we've heard in the media, customers refusing to wear masks and a lack of PPE, as we've heard from Evelyn's video. Um, this finding is consistent with what we've been hearing on the ground from workers. Um, yes, there are legislations in place and guidances from the CDC, but whether these rights are actually enforced at work and actually protecting workers' health and safety is an entirely different story. Next slide, please. So something else that was really disturbing is that we saw in the survey actually a remarkably high amount of workers that actually brought up problems and reported to their employers, but what we saw is that, you know, by and large, the result was that the employer was not reliable in addressing the problem. So, you know, 44% say they brought up a, an issue and yet it was either not addressed or just partly addressed. And further, of those who did bring up their issues, 15% were retaliated against. And so you can imagine this is really powerful disincentive to bring up problems, you know, to air them out, to have them fixed. And this was another case where there was, you know, it was even more stark in the restaurant industry where you know, the actual um, amount of people who were retaliated against was even higher, it was about a quarter. So it's, 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 I think this is a really, really important finding. Um, just even that workers are trying to report things, but then also what happens when they do, because that's, that's where all the recourses begin. And there's a very um, practical reason that workers don't, which is they think nothing will change, or they think that um, you know, they, they will have a, a negative consequence because of it. We wanted to know, um, for those who didn't speak up about COVID-19 protections, why they didn't do so. And we found that a significant number of respondents, 61%, um, um, didn't speak up because they thought that nothing would change, signifying a lack of trust in the employer to do something about a workplace, ha workplace hazard or concern. Almost a third thought that the employer might retaliate against them for speaking up. And almost one in five respondents um, worry about speaking up because of their immigration status or the status of someone in their family. And 15% didn't think it was a serious issue. As a low wage worker advocate over the last five years, I'm not surprised to hear these statistics. Prior to the pandemic, community members um, at our clinic were already worried about being retaliated against for speaking up about workplace problems. They're worried about being fired um, or having their hours cut um, or their immigration status being brought into the picture when they're standing up about their workplace rights. We'll actually hear a little bit more later on about a worker who was retaliated against um, for speaking up um, during the pandemic. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this this is a really kind of fascinating chart that we, you know, we could really delve into and ask a lot of questions about. But, you know, one of the things that we were really curious about is, um, like, were there any trends by, you know, by gender, by industry, um, et cetera. And so, you know, what we see is that of that vast majority that didn't speak up about their concerns because they thought that nothing would change, like, who, who are those people? And is there is there a pattern? So. You know, what we can say now is that 77% were female, um, of those 61% were Asian, 29% Latinx, and 70% were not represented by a union. So that's, you know, makes sense, right? That they have even less protection than um, workers that have a union, you know, to back them up. And, you know, that the, the fact that those who um, face retaliation, right, who did, not, who did not speak up because of fear of retaliation. So 30% of workers, 
in general did not. And among these, again, 73% female, 54% Latinx, 25% Asian, 8% Black, and 63 are not represented by a union. So um, there's lots of patterns here. Another one that was interesting is retaliation based on immigration status. Um, so 19% of workers that didn't speak up about their concerns feared um, that there would be retaliation based on their immigration status. And of those um, that feared retaliation, 84% are Latinx, 80% are women, and 80% are not represented by a union. So you see, you see some of, we start to see some of those variables um, that are constant there. Next one, please. Given the earlier finding that many workers um, are not receiving information from employers about their COVID-19 protections, it is unsurprising that many workers are also not receiving adequate information about paid sick leave. Almost a fifth of workers received three fifths, sorry, almost three fifths of workers um, received either no information or information that could have been misleading or incomplete or unclear information from their employer about the use of paid sick leave. It's really concerning, um, but not a surprise to me that workers aren't getting clear or complete information from their employers about paid sick leave. Paid sick leave is a basic protection um, for workers and other workers in the workplace. The extent to which paid sick leave benefits the community isn't just limited to those at the workplace. It's also about protecting workers' families and our local communities so that workers can stay home when they're sick and not have to worry about putting food on the table or taking public transportation to work. Um, it's also so important for workers to know their rights as the implications trickle through every part of our society. Um, we need advocates like our partners um, who are in touch with workers um, and can educate them about these laws because clearly the employer isn't doing so. And when employers don't follow the law and provide the lawful paid sick leave to workers, then we need to have a strong enforcement system to uphold the law. So the other thing that we found, which is not surprising to us that have worked in this field for a while is that workers are not comfortable bringing up their concerns to their employer. And in this case, specifically symptoms, reporting their symptoms of COVID-19, which we know is so important. Um, and it was actually 20% of, of those that were very uncomfortable. So, you know, this tells you if they're uncomfortable reporting their symptoms, you know, they're probably uncomfortable reporting other problems as well. Next one, please. Lauren, could you please hit enter again so that we could see the quote? Thank you. Um, so as Alejandra mentioned earlier on, um, we conducted some interviews with workers who had experienced COVID-19 exposure or lack of COVID-19 protections. And one of the workers that we spoke to is Mr. Liu. Um, his name um, was changed for the purposes of the report. Um, and he is a Chinese speaking um, janitor who worked at a private school here in San Francisco. And at the beginning of the pandemic, um, his manager refused to provide him with PPE and actually told him to buy his own masks. Um, Mr. Liu was also forced um, to make do with old gloves um, that ripped e easily and were the wrong size. Um, he wasn't told um, what to do if others didn't follow COVID-19 guidelines or whether he could take pay time off to quarantine if needed. Um, and when his coworker, Jenny, was exposed to COVID-19 through her husband, um, their manager told Mr. Liu and Jenny not to tell anyone at school about the exposure. And Mr. Liu told me, I know that this wasn't right, but I was worried about losing my job. Um, and though Mr. Liu's um, employer didn't say anything to him about taking a test or quarantining, Mr. Liu decided to do it himself. He also told me, if I was sick, then the whole school would be sick. Um, Mr. Liu quarantined himself for five days and was not paid any sick leave during those days. When he returned from leave, his manager was verbally aggressive and actually cut his hours, which Mr. Liu perceived as retaliation. Mr. Liu said that he didn't feel like he has been respected as a worker during the pandemic. Um, he said he didn't get gloves or masks at work. How could he protect others? How could he protect his family? Um, he also said that his, his employer didn't speak 
his language, the employer looked down on his work, um, and that the employer doesn't think janitorial work is important. Um, Mr. Liu received a consultation from my office and connected with San Francisco's Office of Labor Standards Enforcement about his retaliation claim. He spoke to an investigator about the unlawful violations that happened at work, including the lack of PPE and the retaliation. An investigator then said that the facts aren't basically aren't in Mr. Liu's favor, um, that there's no clear case of retaliation, and that the employer, employer can say, no, the reduction in hours isn't because Mr. Liu had sought time off due to COVID-19 exposure, but rather that the hours were cut because of the pandemic. And it's so difficult for workers like Mr. Liu um, to counter that reason. In fact, when Mr. Liu heard this, he decided not to continue with his retaliation claim. And Mr. Liu's story is a real life example of the challenges that are oftentimes in retaliation cases and why oftentimes these cases don't come to fruition. Workers are scared of coming forward. Sometimes we have brave workers like Mr. Liu who are willing to speak up about the injustices at work. But then there are gaps in how the anti-retaliation law is written versus how it is carried out in reality. It's really frustrating um, to hear not just for legal advocates and not for directly impacted workers like Mr. Liu to hear this, but it's also their coworkers, because we know that workers speak with each other, um, who hear this and then don't speak up about their own retaliation or concerns in the workplace because nothing would change. This creates a ripple effect um, and workers perceive this as a lack of hope for change in the workplace. So I'm gonna tell you one more story from the interviews. Um, this one is Sophia, also a pseudonym. She's a Spanish speaking worker at a fast food chain in Los Angeles County. And this, she worked at a place where 17 workers got COVID. Um, her employers didn't want to say who got sick at work so that obviously they didn't notify others. And in fact, asked them to deny it. So what the employer said is nobody got sick in here. Be quiet and don't tell anyone. And they didn't think that other workers should know. So they basically said, you don't need to know who got sick, just keep working. So Sophia was asked to do a deep cleaning in a part of the store where there had been a positive case and she refused because she had a medical condition that had you know, left her hospitalized for many months before. And so um, that, that's kind of when the retaliation started. Um, Sophia became sick with COVID-19 um, and actually, this led to eight members of her family also getting sick. Uh, her manager did tell her to stay home, but didn't pay her and told her to only come back when she tested negative. Um, not only did the employer not provide the paid sick leave, but actually told her that she didn't qualify, which is not true. She's, he said that the uh, restaurant did not have to pay her. And so what Sophia did is she contacted a union that intervened and was able to at least help her get paid for two of the, of the four weeks that she was out. And by the way, when she was out, she was sick and she was also caring for um, some of her grandchildren who had asthma and were also sick with COVID at the same time. Um, so, you know, Sophia was also really brave and wanted to take action, wanted to do something about this. And so she knew that there was this effort to, to strike for better conditions. But the employer immediately threatened her saying that, you know, she and her coworkers, if they took any action, their hours would be cut. And if they filed any unemployment claims that they would be denied. And in fact, her hours were cut to 23 a week, um, which, you know, she saw as clear retaliation. And she, well, you know, Sophia also describes not just impact on her, you know, but as Victoria was saying, what the ripple effect is for others. And so some of her coworkers even told her, well, you're lucky because you have papers and you can get unemployment, you can get it in their job, but we can't, you know, they were even more afraid because they had their immigration status to think of. And just one other layer to the story is that Sophia's husband was unemployed because of the pandemic, right? How a lot of people lost their jobs. So that just puts additional pressure on those that do have jobs to do whatever it takes to keep them because now they're the only, you know, um, wage earner in their household. So what are our recommendations? 
Um, based on our findings, we strongly urge that there be an expansion of protections and benefits to workers. This, in this includes ensuring equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines, especially to workers in high-risk environments. We recognize that now here in California, all people um, aged 16 and older are eligible for the vaccine, but the demand is still far greater than the supply. State and local county agencies should continue their promised par partnership with community organizations to conduct outreach to the most vulnerable communities, address fears about vaccination and provide information on how to access paid leave if workers need to miss work due to side effects or getting the vaccine. We also need to expand our health and safety protections to all workers. Unfortunately, federal and state um, health and safety laws continue to exclude independent contractors and privately paid domestic workers from coverage, leaving them vulnerable um, to illness and injury with little recourse. These exclusions must be remedied. And as we've seen in Mr. Liu's story, um, we must also strengthen and enforce our anti-retaliation laws that are supposed to protect workers. We need to create an environment where workers can safe, safely bring up their concerns and stand up for their rights. Undocumented workers also faced a very distressing reality. Um, while many labor laws apply to all workers regardless of their immigration status, many workers are unaware of this um, or not confident that they will be protected. Many employers capitalize on this lack of knowledge and fear. So when undocumented workers face labor violations at the workplace, their fear of retaliation or loss of economic security and stability oftentimes make them stay silent about these workplace abuses. We must provide a pathway to citizenship and expand safety net benefits to workers regardless of their immigration status or employee status. And lastly, we must also expand access to health coverage. This unprecedented pandemic has exposed the gaps where healthcare meets employment. Next slide, please. So in addition to having kind of good laws on the books is the enforcement of those laws. So we also recommend increasing resources and staffing for the state and local agencies enforcing labor law protection. So that could be, you know, Cal OSHA for health and safety, the Labor Commissioner's Office for retaliation and um, paid sick leave. Um, and also, you know, for, for those resources that are there, just really being strategic about how they're used. And, you know, I do want to mention that there is a coalition, a statewide coalition of advocates that do meet regularly with some of these agencies um, to have those conversations of how to focus on high need um, industries and, you know, high profile cases to really stretch the resources that we have um, as much as possible. And, you know, find ways to really increase accountability for violations for employers. Um, as long as there's you know, no credible um, oversight, uh, a lot of employers will keep choosing right the low road. So how do we provide that and also incentives um, for, for good employers right to comply with the law? We also strongly urge the improvement of education and support for workers. We must ensure that materials are accessible to diverse populations in a clear, accessible, multilingual, and culturally appropriate ways to the most hard to reach workers. We also must engage in um, trusted community allies like the Chinese Progressive Association and Fight for 15 so that workers trust and are familiar with because they play a very important role in providing information to workers about labor laws. We also need to provide accessible training um, to employers who would otherwise benefit from the information and training on a multitude of labor and employment law topics. Next slide, please. And so lastly, we know that there's a huge power imbalance in the workplace. Most workers don't have a union. They may not even have a worker center or community-based organization that can support them. And so workers need a voice. They need a voice and they need a seat at the table and they need representation, 
So that can take many forms. It can be a union, a worker center. There's a really interesting model in Los Angeles County of public health councils where workers are protected from retaliation and kind of given the information and support that they need to serve as kind of conduits for bringing up problems with employers and fixing them. So it can, you know, it can take many forms, but workers need to be able to know that they can bring up problems and have some kind of collective power um, to negotiate solutions and not just be you know, singled out and retaliated against. Media coverage um, was very important um, for this project. We wanted to highlight these findings um, and the realities that low wage worker and immigrant workers are facing. So that's why we engaged in strategic communication efforts, um, penning an op-ed um, in the Sacramento Bee and coordinating with other reporters to launch a multitude of coverage around our launch. And this slide and the following slide are actually some um, headlines and screenshots of the different um, coverage that we've received. All right, so the last thing before we open up for questions, we just, you know, some of the things that we were thinking about now is we, we did statewide outreach, but just because of the nature of some of our partners, um, you know, we got kind of clusters in different areas. So it might be interesting to dig deeper into dynamics that are happening in a particular locality. Also, um, you know, like for example, LOHP in the past did a um, collaboration with UFCW on just like uh, retail workers and the supermarket sector, for example. So it might be interesting to also go deep with one particular industry and what's happening and get enough data to make some generalizations about that instead of spreading it out over lots. And then because we designed the survey, um, you know, November, December of last year is when we finalized it, we didn't include questions on vaccines. So that would be something interesting now. Also like access to healthcare, what happened when people got sick? Um, what happened with people's experience with COVID now that a lot of them had it, you know, what was the impact of that? And I, I'm also really curious to, to think about, you know, we know that workers face these problems, like how many of them know what the remedies are? How many of them know, you know, that they can file a complaint with Kalosha or the labor commissioner's office or, you know, what their rights are and what to do about it. And then the other really interesting thing that I think has surfaced in different studies is just the impact on workers' mental health, you know, the stress of this past year, what, what that has looked like. So, um, you know, maybe the last one is just, you know, we had a, a majority of women responding to the survey. And so indirectly, we learned about, the, you know, working, having to take care of kids who were home and working or what child care options were available. So those are some things that, you know, would be really interesting to find out more about. And just some final reflections um, before we open up for questions. Um, it's really striking to note how feel real options um, that low wage and immigrant workers have had during the pandemic. Um, there are protections out there on paper, but many don't know about them. And if the employer isn't following the requirements, then the workers have little, few, little real recourse. Um, workers feel that they're risking their livelihood to push back. And as we've heard in the case of Mr. Liu and Sophia, um, they did risk their livelihood. They spoke up about the lack of protections at work and was retaliated against. So when we're talking about speaking up and potentially losing your job, um, if there's retaliation just to get some paid sick leave um, or some masks, um, it doesn't seem like there's much choice for workers. Um, many workers just decide to get their own masks um, and protection or reuse um, what they have. They try to segregate themselves from their families the best that they can and pray and hope for the best. We really need to change the structural problems that allow these abuses to happen. Vaccines don't address the issues of health and safety, the lack of um, paid sick leave and retaliation at the workplace. We have to. And as we're talking about returning to normal, um, we should re-examine what a new normal could and should be. The next slide actually highlights some of the legislation, which is a good place to start. Um, and we can just quickly review them. Um, there are some California um, specific le legislations that um, strengthens health and safety rights at the workplace. Next slide, please.
Thank you so much for such an informative and powerful presentation. It's amazing to see. Um, you know, we've heard lots of stories, but it's amazing to see um, in real life what's happening and see the data. So thank you very, very much for sharing the important work. Um, please, if people have questions, either um, put them in the chat or feel free to put your audio and video on and, and um, hop in and ask some questions. I just want to mention one thing is that we have uh, Winifred Cow with us, and she's one of the principal designers and authors of the report, Helen Chen, who also was one of the main writers of the report, and Kevin Lee, who did all the quantitative analysis. And so um, I hope that they'll feel free to also jump in to answer questions or add comments. You're getting lots of great job, good, great media outreach, lots of positive uh, notes. I think also we, we can share the link to the report as well in the chat in case people want to click on that. Yeah, that would be great. And we're also um, recording the session, then I'll be able to share the link to that once we have it up on our website. So yeah, thank you all so much for such important work. So important. I have a super basic question. Um, sure, go ahead, Betsy. This is, this is super interesting. I'm wondering, I noticed that the languages that you translated to were, I think, Mandarin, Cantonese, and Spanish. Is that right? And I, I'm wondering about um, the Filipino workers and if if you think you lost some by not having Tagalog or what the what the sort of, I don't know what the demographics are in the Bay Area, but I, I'd be curious if you could comment on that. Thanks, Betsy. Um, so we actually had the um, survey, the promotional flyers, the material translated into um, simplified Chinese. Um, and when we did the interviews, we did them in both Cantonese and Mandarin. Um, we did enlist our community partner at the Filipino Community Center here in San Francisco as a project partner um, in, this, um, in this project. And we did check in with them about whether it was needed to, for example, um, translate the materials in Tagalog. Um, and just based on what they said and based on our experiences um, sort of doing this outreach in San Francisco, we realized that oftentimes um, Tagalog speaking workers are also able to, for example, read and um, write English. Um, so I am not, um, that's actually a really good question. Um, the question that you pointed out about um, translating it into Tagalog, um, but I have not heard um, from our partners about, for example, missing um, a, a, a need there in terms of translating it into Tagalog. Yeah, this is Winnie. I can chime in a bit just to say that FCC, I think, did do some of that outreach um, in helping workers fill out the form and Lao community, uh, Lao family community development also did um, in-person kind of uh, in-language meetings with workers, and then they would enter it into the survey device in English. Um, so that was another way that we tried to bridge the language gap. Well, cool, thank you. Yeah, I know that the language with um, Filipino workers is not, most of them do speak English, I think, but, but I wasn't sure with a survey how that might play out. So thank you for your answers. I'll add one quick thing is I remember in the beginning we were thinking about like should, should we do other languages and, and the other thing that we thought about was the literacy level of those that um, were likely to be answering in that language so would it be really helpful to have something written as opposed to for example give a stipend to a community organization to do a kind of in person asking the questions and helping them fill it out and we it seemed that that was more actually more, more effective. Well also good to know. And Liza has a question about um, if you know these, if these are issues that are California specific or if it's more, you know, if you have other, there's other similar work done across the United States that you're aware of. Oh, do you, do you know, are you aware of other work like this across the United States or are these issues California specific? That's the question. I would not say that they're California specific. <laughs> We're part of a kind of a 
nationwide coalition of groups that engage with health and safety. And honestly, I think it's more industry specific. You know, mm -hmm. if you work at McDonald's or Walmart or wherever, it's going to look the same no matter what state and city you're at, unfortunately. Um, we do cite in our kind of in our introduction to our report a lot of other studies that have a little bit of overlap with ours. And even since ours came out, there's been you know, there's a human impact partners report recently that actually quantified like how many lives would have been saved by having paid sick leave, for example. Um, as I mentioned, some of our partner organizations have put out reports of their own. MCTF, which is a watchdog organization for non-union janitors, uh, recently put out a, uh, survey results just about the janitorial industry. So there's, there's you know, little, little bits and pieces that unfortunately reflect many of the same trends, but really go a little bit deeper into those industry specific dynamics. Great. Well, thank you so much again. We really appreciate having you and thanks to everyone for joining us today. We really appreciate it and hope you have a good uh, rest of the day. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.